Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. If you are a new listener, welcome. I have a gift for you. I curated this 101 ways that it's a list of the things you can do to keep your relationship hot. And it's divided in three levels. So I wanted to make sure I'm including something for everyone. If you're not as adventurous, there are tons of things that you can do on level one. If you are tend to be more adventurous, you experimented with these things, we have tons of stuff on level three that you can experiment. I'm hearing from many of my clients and many of you guys that you found the list very helpful to spice things up in the relationship. So you can find the link in the show notes on how to download the list. Today, we're going to talk about different forms of open relationships. Specifically, we're going to focus more on swinging. When it comes to open relationships, I think it can be a very good fit depending on individual's need. And we had more than, I think, 10 episodes on polyamory. Uh, we had tons of episodes on consensual non-monogamy and only one episode on swinging. So that's why that I thought would be a great idea to invite Dr. Rhoda Lipscomb to talk about this topic because I've been getting getting so many emails about you guys being curious about this type of relationship. We're going to talk about how can you assess if this is the right type of a relationship for you. We're going to talk about uh, some of the practical recommendations, things that you need to keep in mind as you're navigating this new world, how you can make sure that there are kind of like some safety measures in, in place. We're going to talk about why people are staying in the lifestyle for, for many, many years. Years, and we're going to talk about how we can help you to set yourself for success if you're thinking about opening up the relationship. As I mentioned, my guest is Dr. Rhoda Lipscomb. Dr. Rhoda has been counseling and coaching individuals and couples in the area of human sexuality for over 28 years and in private practice for over 14 years, specializing in open relationship styles, polyamory, swinging, designer relationships, BDSM, ABDL, kink, and fetishes. She received her PhD in clinical sexology and is an ASAC certified sex therapist, clinical sexologist, and sexuality coach, specializing in areas of alternative sexuality. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Rhoda Lipscomb. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am so excited to welcome back Dr. Rhoda Lipscomb. Dr. Rhoda, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. I'm excited to be here again. Well, our listeners, they love the episodes that we did on ABDL. And I know that we were just talking about how part of other big part of your practice is helping couples navigate open relationships. And when it comes to open relationships, as we talked about, there are a number of different types of open relationships and not necessarily one type means like it's a good fit for everyone. So tell us briefly about what are some of the similarities and differences between various forms and types of open relationships? Well, yes, I I think especially these days, as there is more information out there in the world, people use a lot of different terminology. And so it can be very confusing to people when they're new to this as to what all the different terms mean and how they work and, and that people don't really realize what a broad range of ways that people design open relationships. I think a lot of people have these beliefs that it's, it's all a certain way or it's all another way. And it's, it's truly not. It, it's, it's a very broad range. What I find is that even all these different terms, I mean, you hear things like polyamory and swinging and the lifestyle and consensual non-monogamy and you know, many, many other terms. Monogamish, I've heard, designer relationships. 
relationships and it's, it can be very confusing. But what they really boil down to is three basic different types. So there's polyamory, swinging, and designer relationships. And in, in many ways, they're similar in that it's different from strict monogamy. They have agreements in place that allow for some type of other interactions with other partners. And that may be just sexual interactions. It may be more emotional depth, but there's something much more than your strict monogamy. The differences are, you know, are, are a lot. Polyamory at its core is that you have that option to have more than one committed partner. So I, I always like to say, think of it as like you can be in love with more than one person. Oh, well, that sounds lovely. <laughs> And it can be. I mean, there are many people who have no problems being in love with more than one person because different people meet different needs. And there are also many different ways of creating polyamorous relationships. So it's a very broad range. But that's really the core of what polyamory is, is that you're having more than one partner who you're emotionally committed to as well as sexually involved with. Swinging, which also sometimes is called the lifestyle by some people, is more along the lines of you have one person that you're committed to. So oftentimes it's couples involved in it and whether they're married or living together, but they're, they're really only involved emotionally with each other, but they have other sexual partners often together, or sometimes they give each other the agreement that they can see other people separately. So that's really the big difference with swinging is that you still only have that connection with one person, despite the other sexual relationships. And, you know, they they may be very casual sexual relationships, or they may be long-term friends. Some people call them playmates, a lot of different terms for that. And then designer relationships, I mean, technically any type of open relationship could be called a designer relationship because they're all designed very differently. But I like to use the term designer relationships for those ones that are very uniquely designed. You know, they're not quite polyamory. They're not quite swinging. They're definitely not monogamy. You know, they may, a good example would be somebody who, let's say they have a job where they work away from home for long periods of time, you know, they may have an agreement that, okay, you're gone for three to six months. Sure. If you want to have another sexual partner in the other state where you live, that's fine. Just don't get too emotionally attached to them. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's different ways of doing designer relationships, but at that core, it's, I think what some people don't realize is that it's, it's not cheating, you know, because everyone involved is aware, is consenting, and and they agree upon the different ways that it works. They have different, some people like the word rules. I don't really like the word rules. It sounds too imposed. Mm -hmm. I like to think of it more as agreements or negotiations where everybody really thinks about why do they want these things to work in the way they want them to work. Right. And I, and I love that that is something that people have more acceptance and understanding around these days, because I truly believe that monogamy is not a solution for everyone. Historically, I've seen so many people feel their failure because they were not able to do monogamy the way that it was expected of them. Exactly. And I think it's very easy to, for our society to judge that if we don't do monogamy the way we've been brought up to believe it's supposed to be done, that there must be something wrong with us Mm -hmm. rather than that. Maybe this relationship type doesn't fit for our needs and to give people more options. 
Right. And I think when it's in the relationship, like you are in the context of being with, with your partner and you want to open up the relationship, it's perhaps it's important to have a conversation about what you want, what your partner wants, like any other sexual or relational aspect. But I'm kind of curious to see what leads, what would be a good fit? And I know it's such a cookie cutter term, but what would be the drawn attraction for, for people with different personality to a different types of these relationships? Because to me, it seems like they have a different flavor and experience depending on what people choose. Oh, absolutely. And I do think sometimes it it actually can be related to people's personalities. People who I would say are not good with a type of open relationship are those who need to be very much rule followers. They don't want to step outside of the box. They certainly wouldn't want friends, family members, neighbors, knowing that they're doing something so very different from what most people would believe most of society does. You know, people like that are not going to do well because you have to have a bit of an independent streak, I think, to do this well. And so that's a real important thing. And Mm -hmm. I have found most people who do well in open relationships are a little bit a little bit on the rebellious side. They're, they're very independent. They may be a bit more of risk takers, you know, in their careers. They may be entrepreneurs. They may do the types of careers where they're a bit more independent and take risks. They might ride motorcycles, go downhill skiing, bungee jumping, you know, those types of more extreme sports. You know, they're not, they're not as kind of in the lane as some, as some people are. Which makes sense because as you mentioned that in order to be able to kind of take on this different kind of lifestyle and having different type of relationship, it requires a little bit of courage. I wish we were in a world that people were more accepting, but like monogamy is these days in most communities, people are kind of assume as norm. So uh, it's going to be some challenges if you are, as you mentioned, deciding to kind of like have a different type of a relationship. So what are pros and cons of each of these relationships? You know, I think the pros of all of them is, I mean, you have that option for more variety, more freedom to experience different types of sexual interactions that just really aren't possible with monogamy. Different people, they're just, their sexual interactions are different. The way they kiss is going to be different. The way they touch, the way they engage in even what are the the exact same types of sexual behaviors, they all do it slightly differently. They have a different energy to them. And you don't get that with monogamy because it's always the same person. Mm -hmm. Um, And for people who like sex with more than one person, I mean, you can't, if you like a threesome or if you like more of a group setting, you can't do that with one person. you like, you just don't get that interaction. Mm -hmm. Plus there's the advantage that if one partner likes certain types of sexual behaviors, you know, maybe they have some types of kink or maybe they really enjoy varying degrees of BDSM, bondage and discipline, dominant submission, sadomasochism, and their partner doesn't, well, at least they can experience that with other partners. Mm-hmm. or f- for any people who are bisexual, that, that way they get to experience um, having sexual interactions with both men and women. And their primary partner may be only one or the other of those, but they still get to have that interaction. They're not, they're not just forced to only have one. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's a lot of advantages to mm-hmm. all of those different things. And, and usually when I ask people, like, what is, what is the biggest thing that they say that they enjoy about it? It's the variety and the freedom, the mm-hmm. freedom to have those different types of interactions. Mm-hmm. The things that are probably problematic about it, especially polyamory, you know, it's complicated, to have more than one committed partner. You know, it's a complication of time because it's not like when you only have one partner who you live with and you spend all your time with. Well, now you've got to, you've got to negotiate time differently so that you're spending enough quality time with each of your committed partners. And depending on how many each of you have, that can really get complicated. Mm -hmm. There's also for some people, I think, 
I think in some ways polyamory is harder. And I'm, by that, I'm, I, what I really mean is that it, because it's so much more outside of the box for monogamy, mm-hmm. you know, swinging or a lot of designer relationships, you still only have one primary partner who's your, your main emotional person, mm-hmm. where with polyamory, you're having multiple love relationships. And that really throws a lot of people off because it's so different from monogamy and the way we're all trained to think about, oh, you had just your one and only, your soulmate. Well, that doesn't really work with polyamory. <laughs> so it's it's much harder for people, I think, sometimes to wrap their heads around that. Plus, you can't be as hidden with polyamory as you can with swinging and designer relationships. You know, there are many people who do swinging or have other partners that their partner knows about, but their families don't know about it. Their friends don't know about it. Their coworkers, their neighbors don't all know about it. It's much harder to hide polyamory because if you have two committed partners and you want to bring both of them to Thanksgiving dinner, you've got to explain this to your extended family as to why both your spouse and your boyfriend or girlfriend are joining you at Thanksgiving. You can't really hide it. You've got to have those conversations with your children. Mm-hmm. And often children do much better if you have a good, honest conversation with them. Oftentimes children do very well with understanding these things. But you can't pretend like, oh, this is just my good friend. Your kids are going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, they're going to know you're lying to them. <laughs> so I think that's the hardest thing is that it still has a bit of social stigma to it. You know, especially for polyamory, it's, it may be a difficult thing if you're in a corporate job. Are you going to bring both your spouse and your other significant partner to the company Christmas party or the company picnic? You know, and if you do, are you going to get the promotion that you were up for, or is it going to go to the person who has the monogamous traditional marriage? Mm-hmm. Well, that makes so, sense. So there are some real pros and cons that way. And some people have had problems you know, with a previous partner, like maybe a previous spouse who they're divorced from, and they'll get into some custody battle when the spouse finds out that they're into polyamory, taking them to court saying, oh, well, they're in this deviant relationship style and try to get full custody of the kids. Mm-hmm. I heard horror stories about those situations that's been used yeah. against people, and especially around custody situations. Yes. And, and, and also, can, it's, I think it's getting better these days, but it also depends on where you live in the country. Mm-hmm. More conservative states, you're going to have a much harder time with it than if you live in a more progressive urban area. Absolutely. And I agree with you that if it is something that uh, sometimes a designer relationships and a swinging, it's something that you are like you're going somewhere is like sometimes it could be different partners. So it's easier to define the boundaries, like as far as practical things. But I think oh. polyamory can be more fluid. Exactly. Yeah. So tell us, I know that we had people talked about polyamory a lot in the show, and I'm kind of curious to understand more about swinging. I think that I get tons of questions when it comes to swinging. Uh, So tell us if people are interested in kind of swinging, what are some of the practical recommendations you have for them? Where should they start? What are some of the safety measures? Sure. You know, I think oftentimes the best places to start are there are a lot of good resources as far as meeting places with internet sites that are specifically designed for people in the swinging lifestyle. And it's a great place to start meeting people, reading some of the blogs or forums and, and kind of find out the way it works. I usually recommend people try to, if they go to a party or a club, try to go to one to start with that's more of a meet and greet. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily you're jumping into the deep end of the pool and going to some big swinger party where there's this kind of expectation to indulge if you're brand new. It's easier if you can go to a party where people are just meeting each other. There's no expectation of sex or hooking up. It's just talking to people and meeting them and getting to know what they're like. Mm -hmm. I think it's a much easier way to kind of start in the, in the 
shallow end of the pool, shall we say, um, and get used to it. Get used to kind of the way people interact very differently than they do in the more generic vanilla world. And I think that's such a good recommendation and because I think like even like any other sexual experiences, you might be interested in swinging, but you might not like the type of people and those specific settings. So I had clients that were going to different parties and say like they were not my, I wasn't sexually attracted to those people. So if you go to the meet and greet, you would know what types of the people are showing, what's the culture of that group? Because all the different meetings, they have their own culture. Oh, absolutely. They all have very different cultures. And even within swinging, there are very different ways of doing it. You know, some people prefer to meet people that they um, have a friendship with first before they start getting sexually involved. You know, other people prefer the more sort of random, you meet somebody, you're attracted to them. All right, let's go. You know, there's, there's not a better way of doing it. It is more about personality and what works for people. But I often hear people when they get into swinging, they're like, oh my God, it's going to be orgies and I'm, I'm going to be so overwhelmed. And it's, it isn't necessarily. Mm-hmm. What I found in swinging oftentimes is that people get into it for that, that excitement and that sexual variety, which is kind of the initial phases when people start off with it. But that the people who stay in it long term, and by long term, I mean more than three years, they tend to stay in it for the community. Mm. They stay in it for, it's less about the sex and it's more about the people they meet, the friendships they make, this community of like-minded people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, they feel like they've found their tribe. Mm. And, and that's what really keeps people in it long term. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like any other kind of like interest that you have, this can be, as you mentioned, that the opportunity for you to cultivate your tribe. Because it's my experience, even with clients that they were in a polyamorous relationship all their life, they share with me that they, when, when they're now older, their lovers, past lovers are part of their support system and they have been helping them throughout the difficult times in their lives. Oh, Absolutely. You know, I mean, I always tell people I understand this not only just from the academic standpoint, because I have a PhD in clinical sexology and I've about probably 12 to 14 years of working with people in this population, but my husband and I have also been in an open marriage for about 12 years and we tend to lean more towards the swinging side of it. And we have some amazing friends that we've known for many years. And I would say really that that connection and that community is, is what keeps us in that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, and I think going back to the recommendation of meet and greet versus committing yourself to an activity, such a good point because the the other clients that I work with, they shared with me that like they booked the swinging vacations for the first time. And that turned out to a disaster because that's, that's not what they expected. And now you're on that cruise and you, you got to kind of have to manage it. So I think it's important, as you said, like to start from a place that you are assessing, kind of exploring before committing to a, a full like 14 days co- co- cruise. <laughs> right. Well, and, and even with a cruise, I think if you go in it with the aspect of we are new, we are checking this out, and you you tell people this as you meet them, mm-hmm. that I, I think that would make a difference on a cruise because most of the people I have met in this in the swingy lifestyle, if you let them know that hey, I'm very new, we're checking this out, we're still a little nervous, they're going to respect that, mm-hmm. and they're going to be like. Great. You can go at whatever pace you want, you know, just interact with people, have conversations if that's all you're ready for. If you want to watch, you can do that. And you can join in at at whatever point you feel ready. And so I think a big part of making that type of situation work well is the communication. I think some people get on the cruises and they're like, we're here, we have to do it. It's like, (laughs) no, you don't. (laughs) Right. And like having an open communication with yourself, with your partner, kind of giving yourself permission to change your mind if you're not comfortable, like any new experience, you're kind of like exploring and see, checking in with yourself if this is for me or not. When it comes to safety, do you have any recommendation for safety for people who are super new to this? You know, I, I always recommend that people 
you know, make sure they get tested for any type of sexually transmitted infections ahead of time so mm-hmm. that they know what their status is. Because sometimes people have infections they don't even know they have, mm-hmm. because not all of the STIs have the same symptoms for everyone. So at least they know where their starting point is. Mm-hmm. You know, using whether it's male condoms or female condoms, I personally think female condoms are better because they actually give a little bit better protection, but they're awkward to use and they're not as easy to, to purchase. So male condoms are fine for most part. I think a lot of it's also talking with each other about what level of risk are they really comfortable with? Mm -hmm. Because even, even under the best of circumstances, even for people who use condoms very consistently, there is still a certain level of risk. And it is a matter of figuring out what level of risk you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's certainly like more risk with swinging than there is oftentimes with polyamory because generally polyamory only have maybe two to four partners Mm -hmm. where most people who are into swinging are generally having more than that per year. (laughs) And so it is what level of risk are you comfortable with? Amazingly though, even people who are, very active within the swinging community don't generally show, I mean, the studies that have been done don't generally show as much incidence of sexually transmitted infections as people would expect to find. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm not quite sure why that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if it's more, maybe because most of them are more kind of middle class, middle age, that has something to do with it. But it doesn't seem like there's as many. I mean, occasionally you hear about an outbreak here or there of something, you know, an outbreak of chlamydia or an outbreak of HPV or something. But Mm -hmm. overall, it's not as high as people would fear that it is. Mm -hmm. That is very reassuring, but it kind of makes sense (laughs) if you feel that, you know, like this is sexuality is a big part of my life and I'm valuing this and I'm valuing my body and I'm thinking about it, perhaps like it's like a gift that you're valuing it and you are taking care of it. So, and I think at times it's my experience that my clients that are in a a non-monogamous relationships, they are more mindful of like getting tested and all of that versus people who are in a monogamous relationship, they're assuming their partner is uh, monogamous and they're not necessarily paying as much attention to all those required safety things that they need to do. Right. And and most people who swing, they carry condoms and lube on them, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, so they're prepared Mm -hmm. where your, your person in the general population who either goes to a bar or meets Mm -hmm. somebody randomly, Mm -hmm. they're not prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And often, particularly if they've met someone in a bar, they've been drinking, they're, you know, they're, they're making decisions not as well as they would if they planned ahead to know that they're going to have a sexual interaction. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that does make a difference why you don't see as much in that population as you might in other populations and the frequency of testing. You Mm -hmm. know, most people in the swinging lifestyle, depending on how many partners are having, they're getting tested on a regular basis, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, maybe every three months or every six months or fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. So I think that makes a big difference as well. The thought that I have about kind of like safety of the couple that you are swinging with is that when should one ask about their uh, testing a status? Like, is that something that they agreed on before? Is it like you're asking during the party? When would be a good time? You know, I think that's a tough one because there's so much shame around the issues of sexually transmitted infection. And while some people will talk very openly about test results and when was the last time they were tested, it's not like people carry around their test results. So you're kind of having to take their, their word for it. Mm-hmm. And let's face it, if it's somebody you just met, how well do you know them to know whether or not they're being completely honest? Mm-hmm. I really tell people, you know, it's, it's up to yourself to keep yourself safe. I wouldn't count on either that somebody's being honest with their test results or that they've had them as frequently as they say they have. And that's, it's not to say anything bad about people. It's just that you have to decide what level of risk you're willing to take. Mm -hmm. And it's up to you to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure, then maybe you need to be tested more often or more frequently. That makes sense. You don't have necessarily control over them, but you have control over your sexual health decisions that you're making. Exactly. Yeah. 
you know, and for, I, I know female condoms are not as well known, but for, especially for women, I often recommend that they look into the, the concept of female condoms. They're, they're not made out of latex, they're polyurethane, so they're a bit stronger. They do cover a bit more of the skin area from the vulva. So they're, they're a little awkward. They're a little diff- different to get used to. But they, if you're really more concerned about protection, you know, female condoms are going to give more protection than male condoms are. Well, that's a great recommendation. And I, and I think it's just a matter of getting used to it. I know that it's more oh, yeah. customary that uh, like if people are using male condom, which is like it's more been around, as you said, more accessible. But just yeah. a matter of seeing, kind of trying it and see if, if that's something that kind of after two, three sessions, making a decision after that versus kind of for like first time saying that I don't like it. Yeah, you kind of you have to practice with it, and and definitely you've got to have a, some type of good sexual lubricant with female condoms that you may or may not need as much of with male condoms. Any other recommendation you have before we close today for couples that they want to make set themselves for success when they want to open up their relationship, so they kind of know that okay, I want, we want to explore consensual non monogamy, but they don't know what what to do around that. Well, I think the biggest thing that people need to start with, and it's one of the big mistakes I often see people because they don't do, is that you've got to start with really having an honest discussion about where is the the foundation of your relationship at? You know, how healthy is your foundation? How solid is it? Because when people start getting into open relationships and there's other issues in the background, it's very difficult to do that successfully because you're making a big change in your life. And if there's any type of issues of, you know, maybe there's issues over child rearing, maybe there's issues over career and, and other household issues. If there's any past affairs that have never really been dealt with, that they just kind of talked about it, swept it under the rug, but never fully healed it that should probably go back and be readdressed. Mm-hmm. And, and how do they deal with conflict? What, what is really their conflict style? Are they, are they the type of couple who turns towards each other and really works together as a team when they have conflict? Are they the type who turn against each other and try and blame the other one for whatever the problem is? Or are they the type who turn away from each other and shut down, don't talk for days or weeks, and then just ignore the problem. Because if you're one of the last two, obviously you're going to have a lot more problems Mm -hmm. than if you're in the first category where you're, you have more of a team approach and you look at it as this is our problem. How are we going to fix it together? Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad you were, you were talking about, it's not the solution for glossing over the situation, the problem that you guys are having. And the reason I'm saying that at times, perhaps I've seen it sometimes that one of the partner fell in love with someone or want to kind of act it out with someone else that specific person <laughs> and that's that's where the urge comes from i'm not saying that that's 100 percent not going to be successful but it's right. different if you are starting from a place of kind of being more kind of bit honest with your partner and kind of having as you said a strong foundation and thinking about we're good therefore we can explore versus like you know inside we have tons of problem and we just want to distract ourselves right and making sure that at least both of you have some interest in it. It's, it's definitely not going to work if one is pressuring the other, like one is completely opposed and the other is saying, absolutely, I have to have this or I'm leaving you. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if that's the case, maybe you need to let them leave. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> And people's interests can change. So I think the, you're right in those situations. If people have a new reaction and they're going into it and feeling resentful and kind of like later on, they feel like the partner owes something to them. That's not definitely a good path. But sometimes oh, yeah. people are going on with neutral mindset. I'm neutral about it. This is not like I'm super excited, but I'm willing to explore it. And I think at times that can be a useful place to kind of like, if you want to kind of be curious to go and explore it. Yeah, if you can at least be neutral. Now, you might be nervous. You might be a bit anxious. You're not sure where this is going to lead or how it's going to work. or And that's still okay. Uh, but it's it's more those people who are just, they're absolutely opposed and they're only doing it because their partner is pressuring, giving them so much pressure. Mm-hmm. 
That's right. No, and I, and I think all these things you mentioned were just so relevant to the challenge of challenges of the many of the couples that I see that they are kind of exploring these options. And I bet there are tons of more resources that you have on your websites and uh, the writings that you've done that people can access kind of more of this good, wonderful information that you shared with us. Where would be some of the good places that people can check out if they're interested in your content? Sure. I have a book that I wrote about three years ago called No More Hiding, Permission to Love Your Sexual Self. It is available on Amazon and people can also find a link to it on my website. My website is www.drrhoda.com. And I have information on open relationships, some resources there, as well as some information. I About a year ago, I created an online education and training program for people who are in those new phases of open relationships to really help train people about all the different things that they need to think about when making these kind of changes. The stuff like looking at the foundation, how to have a stronger relationship, you know, those different mindset shifts they have to make, making sure they're dealing with the emotions of jealousy and envy and, you know, how to deal with that and be stronger in that. And so that's always an option if people are interested in that online program. Excellent. So I leave a link in the show notes with all the wonderful resources that you mentioned. And thank you so much for coming back. This was, I hope that was, this was a very helpful for our listeners. I know I learned tons of great content and hopefully we'll see you in near future on our show. Yes. Thank you so much for having me back again. I really enjoyed it. I hope if open relationships are something that you are curious about and you're interested to explore with your partner, you got some good information from our conversation. It's my experience that it's important for people when they would like to open up the relationship to kind of reflect and kind of think about what might be a good fit for them. And at times it's challenging to communicate your desire to your partner and expectation if you are in a monogamous relationship and you're thinking about opening up the relationship. If that's something that you're interested, you can always explore with a sex therapist with your partner and a sex therapist can help you to communicate the message that you have to your partner and help you guys as a unit to process some of the emotions that might come up. So if that is something that you're interested, you can always reach out to me. I have a video counseling practice. I still have some in person, but also a big part of my practice is video. Granted that right now I'm recording this during COVID time. So my practice is 100% online, but my hope is by the time this episode goes live, there are going to be some in-person appointments as well. So you can go to the link in in the show notes. And if you're interested to book an appointment to do video counseling with me, you can book it and from that link. I hope you guys are doing well and I'm going to talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.